Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Blown Speakers. This is episode 24. Uh, I'm Dave Henningman coming in from Yokohama, Japan. With us again is Montgomery Fox coming in from DC, Washington, DC. And our very special guest tonight coming in from Cleveland, Ohio is Annie Gypsy Hazenall. Welcome, Gypsy. Hi, you guys. So, um, hmm. how are things in Cleveland, my hometown? <laughs> um, they're beautiful as always. Um, it's a beautiful place here. 81 degrees and sunny today. A week ago, um, snowstorm. So yeah. <laughs> it's just things are normal. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a Cleveland spring, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. That's right. The wicked jet stream. One day you're 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 uh, you're ice skating there, and then you're and then you're surfing Lake Erie the next day. It's amazing. So uh, so how are things in Washington, Fox? Hey man, we we've been battling this jet stream too. Can't decide which season it is. Gosh dang it! Luckily, I am armed with layers of sweatshirts and long sleeves. No problem over here, man. No problem. <laughs> so yeah. Cherry blossoms have been great. I got down there. That was great. Yeah, from just Japan. getting around. That's true. Thank you, honey boy. Thank mm. you. My pleasure. Yeah, so pleasure. all's well. But I'm heading into a nice spring break. We had a bountiful Easter. Happy Easter to everybody. And uh, and uh, so now we're heading into a nice spring break. So that's joyous, joyous. And it's nice to come out of this ap apocalyptic uh, darkness of uh, the Diamond Dogs. Yeah. So. Uh, Gypsy uh, chose the album we we are going to discuss today. That's right. So, uh, so yeah. why why Diamond Dogs? You know, Bowie is this. He's just alien. You know, he's like it's not of this world. And I've always just had an affinity since I was a little girl. My brother introduced me to him. You know, as a kid, and I um. You know, his music is just enigmatic. And, and I never really listened to Diamond Dogs until it was about 10 years ago. My husband and I were redoing, we were painting our old kitchen. And we just picked it up at the record store and we put it on a record player. And literally for hours, hmm. hours, we just painted this kitchen. We didn't really talk about the song. We just, you know, we'd listen to side A. And then I'd go and flip it to, you know, B-side and we'd listen to that. And then he'd go and then flip it to side. Like we literally listened to this album, 1400, <laughs> mm. it, it, the whole night. And it was just, and we like didn't Like two really coats, talk. that's two coats and a dry, two dries yeah. and a two, wow. It was, it was, and we didn't really talk about it because we were just, I mean, it, 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 we were just listening to it and just mesmerized by it because it is nothing like I've ever heard before. You know, it's not, it, it's just, it was so different from any of the other Bowie that I had loved, you know, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a Bowie aficionado, but um, I certainly love this era of him, I guess the most. Mm -hmm. um, like, but this one just, it's like haunting, you know, mm. you can stop listening to it. So I, I was happy we chose this because, yeah, I've been into different Bowie albums at different periods of my life, but I, I haven't really focused on this album until now. So it's, um, yeah, thank thank you for choosing this. Oh, my God. Um, Gyps, I can't thank you enough because uh, the same thing happened to me because, I mean, I don't think we could have put our ears around this at a younger age, you know, I understood, and we'll talk about all of our Bowie journeys, I hope, but like, just to say, I could understand as a freshman in 87, Ziggy Stardust, like that. And I, it was like, ooh, shoot to the veins, easy, cheesy, you got me. And that was it, that was it. And I was like, I love this guy. And then, and then, but I don't remember like going then, wanting to go through his catalog or anything. I was like, I'm amazingly satisfied. This is incredible. <laughs> and then other hits creep through. This album never found me until, yes, until now. I swear, I swear to God. I think I had heard about him doing some sort of conceptual weird thing. And I'm like, well, I guess I'll get to it. 
And <laughs> here we are. Oh, mm. my God. Oh, my God. And I don't think I could have gotten it unless I was older, right? Do you think your age and experience had a lot to do with it? Definitely. I, I feel I'm so excited to talk to this about with you guys, especially about this, because some of my fondest memories of us when we were in our 20s and we were kids, um, just sitting around and listening to a record, listening to an album, like a record, and talking about what the lyrics mean and the story because they're an album like just from beginning to end it it's there's nothing quite like that you know um it tells a story and you guys we're all English teachers we're all teachers and so I know that there's also that aspect of it that I just that I knew you would I would hope I hope I hope that you'd be drawn to it you know because it is it's this like incredible story <laughs> That to me. Well, good. Yeah. I want you to, because I didn't, I mean, part of that, I didn't even try to get into. I mean, I'm following who Halloween Jack is and the kids and different characters. I kind of wanted to just wrap a mood around me and try to feel the mood. Now, if there's an arching plot line outside of the whole 1984 bit, I get that. Yeah. Well, but I, that's, wow. I didn't listen to the podcast that you guys listen to. I really just, Sometimes it's kind of it's kind of like when somebody tells me about a student that I'm going to have and they tell me, oh, you better watch out for this one. I don't want to hear about it because I just want to, <laughs> I want to know that kid on my own mm. and make my own generalizations. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't want to have some preconceived notion and I just, and my experience will be different just like listening to an album. So I didn't, I don't listen to any, I didn't listen to it. I just know that my, right. that I got, and Brian, Brian literally, you know, he, He's so fun to listen to music. With That's great. At it, you know, from that angle as well, as far as storytelling goes. Mm. Um, but it, I mean, basically, the story is of 1984, right? And it's like living well, yeah. through this world, and we got to make it, and are we going to make it? And um, but we don't make it, kind of. Well, the whole. Um, I, I originally, I think he, I mean, Bowie is just a complete entertainer. You know, he loved mm -hmm. just being a show showman. And um, his, uh, I know that it was originally, he wanted to do a rock opera to 1984 and Orwell said no, or his wife. Mm. Yeah. And, um, but I think listening to it, and this is not my original thought, this is totally my husband, mm. but he, he said that first howl, you know, the first howl of the, in the album that I played for you just 10 minutes ago <laughs> on my record, that was pure feedback. Um, it was uh, the beginning of a future legend. It's almost as if the archangel, and I don't know if you ever taught Paradise Lost, but I feel like it is totally, he is just thrown from heaven. And he's just like, oh, shit. You know, <laughs> with rats yeah. beside cats. And ca it's just, it's, uh -huh. it's He's like, what, what have I gotten myself into? And it's that whole journey that he takes into making heaven, like, if I can't live in heaven, then I'll make a heaven out of hell. So I wow. kind of, yeah. and, and listen to just the segue from the, be from that fall from heaven, you know, that fall from grace, which metaphorically could be our, our humanity's fall from grace, which is why we all end up, you know. Well, we don't all end up there. I don't want to be too. <laughs> I don't want to be too cryptic. We should. I feel like we should play that. It's really short, but it's there's a lot of yeah. imagery packed in there, right? So. Yeah. There yeah. is a lot of imagery packed in there. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And in the death. As the last few corpses lay rotting in the slimy thoroughfare, the shutters lifted an inch in Temperance Building high on Boucher's Hill, and red mutant eyes gazed down on Hunger City. No more big wheels. Fleas the size of rats sucked on racks the size of cats, and 10,000 peeploids split into small tribes, covered in the highest of the sterile skyscrapers. Packs of dogs assaulting the glass fronts of Lovney Avenue. 
ripping, reed wrapping Lincoln shiny silver clubs. Now records, family badge of sapphire and cracked emerald. In the day now, the gear of the diamond dance. Mm. <laughs> it's really, it's really scary, isn't it? Gosh, it's scary. And then when it transports you there with the crowd, like that's taking you to the world. It's like, this is like how we live almost. And I mean, yeah, it, it's just remarkable how it takes you from that scene straight there. Um, oh, but that howl of him and, and I hear, yeah, there you go. Cause I hear a lot of different sides of Bowie. So you talk about that little howly scream he does in the beginning. That's like him, him exhaling. What I hear Bowie then, then it's right into this cool, sexy rock and roll song. Track two, when it comes in soft and he's like, Ooh, I mean, it is so beautiful. You hear his soul there. And I think you do hear that agony he's going through trying to put this together, you know. Um, mm. Wayne, so, but it's also scary um, that he mentions he mentions rats, right? Rats the size of <laughs> That's the size of cats, but when you when you think about the end of 1984 and what they do to Winston with the rats, I mean that. Uh, I mean if 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 that needs to be intensified, that suddenly those rats are even bigger and scarier than uh, you, you originally thought. I mean that's yeah, it totally gives me the creeps that intro. I mean it's it's awesome. Yeah, I never taught 1984, and I just I felt I don't know. They, they don't want us to. Oh, they don't. I'm just kidding. No, I don't oh. know. <laughs> no, like Animal Farm. Ew, figure it out for yourself. They're yeah. animals. It's not well, real. I, I, but I don't I, think, I, you know. Did, well, and I've taught the giver. I mean, so much of our literature is dystopian. And hmm. um, I mean, modern, contemporary writing. You know, think about uh, Hunger Games and all that. True. So that, it's hot right now. That's true. That's true. Did you you say you have taught it or, or you haven't? No. Okay. No, uh -huh. I never have. Huh. I certainly didn't learn it in school. Um, yeah, no, I didn't either. I read Animal Farm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I read Animal Farm, but I don't really have any desire to teach it. I feel like the kids are kind of living it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just turn on the yeah. And that's what I loved about this, the, the whole concept of Orwell writing this in the 40s yeah. about the future of 1984. And then Bo is living in a kind of post-World War II, can't put the world back together well world. Vietnam. Yeah, Vietnam. Vietnam. And also Britain is kind of like an armpit now. And they're really, there's kind of violence there too. I mean, they're, they're not really involved in Vietnam, but they're feeling it and they're protesting, you know, yes. But they're having more flack from Ireland, I guess. And they're catching union shit. And they're they're just a mess, you know, England is. And so they're like, uh oh, we need more control. So Bowie's like living through a sort of Orwellian world. And he is even thinking that, oh my gosh, guess what's gonna happen in Bowie's 1970s world? Here comes Reagan. And Margaret Thatcher, he doesn't even know that that's coming. Or maybe that's what he saw coming, you know, which you could say was very Orwellian, shut down the shit, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And then here we are now with real live Big Brother, like cameras everywhere, Ray Bradbury style, TVs, everywhere. Unbelievable, you know. Hey, spe no. speaking of uh, Ray Bradbury, were, were either of you guys with me when I saw uh, Ray Bradbury speak at UD? I was, I was with you. Oh, nice, that nice. Was my, that was one of my favorite moments because I waited in line to get his autograph and I felt like I was a kid waiting for Santa because he was so, with his white hair. And I remember <laughs> to this day, I teach a lesson for my students um, for creative writing, how to get started on writing, and I use it from that, from that, um, from that lecture that we went to, and how he just said he he starts with the letter A, and he writes all the words that he knows with A that are A words, and then he gets exhausted, so he starts making up his own A words, and then when he gets exhausted, that then he goes to B. Wow. To C. <laughs> I was like, well, you holy know, guacamole. 
Yeah. So it's a fun, ex, ex, you know, exercise that I do with my students. But yes, I was with you, honey boy. Wow. So I, I remember him saying that day, um, you know, advice to the young people, you know, us at the time. <laughs> he said, um, jump off the cliff and build your wings on the way down. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think I've been doing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then at the last the last second he's like, with an ink and paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean with an ink and paper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could blame I could blame him for everything that's happened since that day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, talking of such techniques, honey boy, I'm sure you're you might get to this later, but Bowie's using a lot of different techniques to help him uh, write during this album. Mm -hmm. The cut and, up, and it, yeah, the cut up technique, which is something you may have used and or or uh, heard about, where you know you kind of write a whole bunch of stuff, but then you sift through it and you just cut out a few phrases, sentences that really mean something. And then you arrange them in a shorter thing, you know, on you know, almost turn a sonnet into a haiku, and then you have something. And Bowie uses this technique. Edward Edward Bur uh, Burroughs uses it, I guess. William yeah. uh, William Burroughs, right? And then Dylan, I heard, used it. You know, and it's a fun little way to 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 get together imagery and set a tone. And so certain tunes. He did, he used that here to have some fun, you know, to, to, to get it out, you know, and it works great for rock and roll couplets. It's mm -hmm. the best. It's the best. <laughs> Honey boy, you always loved Burroughs. Wasn't he one of your favorites? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I remember that. Mm. And I remember um, my mom was mad at me for reading. I, I don't know. She, I don't know if she called him a communist or what. I don't know what her <laughs> deal was. I maybe. <laughs> For reading, yeah. reading Naked Nick Lunch? What? For which which book? Was there a certain book she disliked? Or... No, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> but I know she was definitely um, more of a Thoreau fan. But, but Gypsy, I remember your, your mom um, disliked um, Oscar the Grouch because it <laughs> glorified a guy living in a trash can or something like that. Oh my God, you totally remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I loved, Ses like, when my kids were little, I literally would sit and make them watch Sesame Street because I felt like I needed to make up for lost time. And my mom would sit and watch it and said, oh, this is darling. Uh, oh, this is educational. I said, yes, isn't it, mother? <laughs> so said, now she likes it. <laughs> she's amazing. Oh, she's such a wonderful grandmother. She's awesome. That's that woman cool. is a force. That's but uh, she lived, she, she knew, she, one of her friends, like, hung out with the Velvet Underground. Wow. She said, Mom, you lived in New York City at the time when all the music I'm listening to was. Exactly. Hit. We're born in 72. We're born to, to Ziggy. So we could have been conceived yeah. at the factory. So did she talk about how you were conceived at the factory and, oh. and like, hanging out in the scene? No, my mother was I'm all <laughs> fell in love, housewife. But I, I, I know, literally I envisioned. I, I would. Oh, say, exactly. Yeah. Did she, did, they, did she ever see him live or anything? Have you guys ever seen Bowie live? No. no. God, I really. Not really oh regret shit! That I, I have. I have. Wow. Mm. Did you see him? Hell yeah! Well, I couldn't figure it out. I had to remember, and that's hard to do. But you know, I I sat on my memory chair. And then I, I got on my thumbs and I asked Chris Mooney, shout out Chris Mooney. And I didn't know if it was going to be the 87 or the 90 tour because I got on the internet and you can find out anything you want. And so I said, oh, it must have been, it, it wasn't the 87 tour because that was at the Cap Center. That was Glass Spider. So we saw him 1990, Sound and Vision. Hmm. Unbelievable set list. I mean... I knew it was a special show. I remembered a lot from the show. I rem I it, it was just the greatest hits. It, you know, Sound and Vision, if you remember that. Yeah. Uh, 1990. It was just like, oh my God, greatest hits. It is just the best show. So, um, and we were trying to remember who went. It was definitely me and Mooney. It might have been Mooney and Kathleen, his girlfriend. I third wheeled it a lot back in those days. 
but Bart might have came. The biggest thing I remember is like a giant sheer screen coming down and a giant China girl dancing. And then David Bowie's out in front. And then he and the giant woman are dancing together. What the? I mean, no, such a performer. He just never stopped, and so, so you know, my, my yeah, my Bowie goes deep because I mean, I first knew him from, of course, you guys too, MTV, and like Let's Dance video was the rockinest all time video, and then and that album itself, and then I don't know if you guys watched professional wrestling, but Vince McMahon got the rights. To modern love uh, and so the outro of professional wrestling every week was the outro of modern love which has got this thwacking drums as it outros i was like that's amazing and i realized what that was and so <sighs> you know but why i i just kept bowie there I was like, he's just a greatest hits machine. That's all he is. He's like, but he's so much more and why this album couldn't get me until we were older and have to fucking go through and pay bills and have children and go through pain and agony and life's, you know, meat grinder to then be like, oh, you know, wow, this is heavy and deep and amazing. Yeah, I always, um, I, I really never had any desire to go see him live. I never really had any desire to go see the, the big, you know. Ray, uh, well. There's the huge concerts at stadiums uh, where I'm going to see this, I'm going to see David Bowie this big, you know. Oh, I know. No, this was an outdoor amphitheater. I couldn't see him at all. That's why the only thing I can remember is the giant <laughs> China girl. <laughs> Uh, we're dancing in the lawn with a picnic style. I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, of course, Bowie. Just I mean, Marquee him. Club. Could you imagine seeing him in those early days, like that tour in smaller clubs? That that'd be pretty amazing. Mm. All right, here it is. Nice. Is there a glare on it? No, there is. But yeah, we we can get the. We can get the feel Ouch. for it. Nice. Strange living boutique. <laughs> so it's kind of, when I opened this up, when I first opened it up, my kids were five. And I <laughs> like, immediately closed it. It's <laughs> wrong, mommy. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. But isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Album cover. It, I, I it, don't like it. I, I mean... It is, it, I mean, maybe it's doing what it's supposed to do. It creeps you out, you know? Yeah. I, and I, I like, and, and yeah, and I think it's like the guy, I think the whole purpose of the album is the fold out. Gotcha. Because <laughs> yeah, when you put it all together and you see the back there, you're like, ah! you know? And so I don't know. I, I mean, I, yeah. I don't know anything about the artist. You said that you knew something about the artist who actually did this cover. A little bit. Yeah, he's Fox. supposed to be a, yeah, he's a well-known, he's just a well-known artist that got around, you know, that was doing some fun things with grotesque sort of colors. And I mean, he was just the new artist on the scene. So do you guys uh, have any idea who these two characters are? Characters are in the back? Um, uh, the you know, no, you know, I never there's heard. a lot of seductive. You know, I mean, they seem like kind of seductive, uh, you know, like almost like they're the diamond dogs, like they're the ones that are coming to get you, you know. And they're the they're the um, they're the people who live in the alley. No, there. Okay, was well, Bowie's the dog because he's got the dog legs. There, I guess. Um, so this is oh, the back. Right, nice. the back cover. We could look at the track listing later. Yeah, but when you fold it out, right, you get the whole body of uh, David Bowie. <sighs> Upper body of David Bowie, lower body of a dog, right? Um, a diamond dog. So what do you think that symbolizes? What do you think 
He's half man, half dog. <sighs> um, do you, you have a theory on that there, Fox Montgomery? The half oh, man, it. half dog thing, or what? How does the yeah. whole diamond dog? Well, thing? It's evil. It's evil. It's not good. It's not good. You know, I don't think there's. I think there's an evil sort of overtaking that's going on. I mean, dogs like dogs like uh, dogs are bad. Dogs are chasing at your heels. They're catching, um, you know, the the devil dogs at the heels. You know, and, and you know, heel. You know, um, all that illusionaries. Yeah, dogs aren't good. So I think it, you know, he's a it's like a devil dog sort of thing. Yeah, you know. it's like the the city he's kind of introducing in the. That's that, true. Yeah, you know, first of, track you could picture these dog. horrible dogs running around the city, um. But in this case, they're uh, they're glam rock dogs, I guess. But we're not talking about some sort of cosmic metamorphosis, right? Not that didn't happen. There's not like a. I, uh, I, I, you don't think a, a nuclear out is there a nuclear outbreak in in 1984 uh, or in this album or like there's no reason to be a half man half dog like this isn't part of the plot line i'm saying um, this is just some wow imagery i think like the the atmosphere the environment he's presenting is like so crazy and dangerous that something like this creature could exist Gotcha. Like that's what I thought. That's if it doesn't th exist saying. now, it's on its way to existing very soon. Ooh. <laughs> Are the well, dichotomy rats the size of cats, of yeah. Mm. Ooh, What's that, Chip? Dichotomy, like we're all half dog. Like we're all still there. Lizard brain. Well, mm. I like the dichotomy in all of us, I guess. We have that. Um, there is a little bit of the dark side lurking in all of us. And yeah. when he does get tossed down it's it's just this this oh my god what the hell where am i and then and then everyone in the alley is come join us come on it's fun you'll love it that whole temptation when they tossed me out of the garden you know what was he in the garden of eden was he was he you know kicked out and like angry about it and then all of a sudden he said well if you can't beat him join him right mm -hmm. it's all in us anyway i don't know that's I don't know. Not hmm. anything no, I mean, there's just a lot of great imagery swirling around, right? And it's I all. I never about really looked at those two women behind them because I was so transfixed with the the image of David Bowie as a half dog. It freaked me out. <laughs> <at her. laughs> um, and I like. <laughs> so Fox, you wanted to mention about. Uh, so this is his name is uh, Guy Perra Perato. Guy yeah. Perart. Um, we could look him up. Maybe he's from... Guy he's Pilart? Dutch? He's, he's, I think he's Scandinavian. Scandinavian. He's a Belgian artist. <laughs> Belgian <laughs> artist. Nice, nice. Okay, yeah. Um, Same difference. All right. <laughs> Fox is always dissing other nations. Um, it's uh, all right. All right. So, what did you want to say about our friend Guy here, Fox? What's What's really funny is is I heard the story about how um, he was an artist of of the day, I guess, of the late seven, late sixties, early seventies. He was getting around town, and these were the days when a lot of the rock and rollers were mixing with the artists. You know, so was you know Lou Reed and Andy Warhol and Dave Bowie's hanging out with that scene. And so it's like, for some reason, you can paint on a wall or on canvas and you can rock and roll. I guess you, you guys should get together. I don't know why the, you know, the clay artists didn't join that scene. If we had, we'd have more sculptors, I don't hear them <laughs> hanging out. Like, look at my, look at my mug, <laughs> Lou Reed. You know, that doesn't happen. But anyway, this guy comes around and everyone's like, look at him, look at his stuff. And David Bowie's like at a party with Mick Jagger and Mick Jagger's talking him up. And Mick Jagger says to David at the party, he's doing the cover of our new album. You know, our new album, it's only rock and roll, David. He's going to do the cover. And then David's like, oh, yeah, when's your, when's your album coming out? Later this year. Well, mine's coming out earlier this year. <laughs> and he asked the guy to do his cover. Nah, and so, and so Mick, Mick is like, Oh, David, you know, like they're all because they're kind of jockeying for position. David's the young guy on the town, man. David's just killing it. At this point, 73, 74, David's the new, the new kid on the block and the new great 
kid on the block. The Stones are already old. <laughs> you know, by, I don't know, they're still the Kings, rather. They're 72. I mean, Jesus Christ, they're the Kings. But the Kings are always nervous about what's behind them. So they saw David Bowie. Said, and Mick's like, what the fuck? You just stole my artist. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, you can never wear new shoes around David. <laughs> <laughs> That's the quote. Was that from that um, podcast you guys listened to? Totally. I got to give a big cheers to this podcast, man. This guy did a podcast during the quarantine, maybe even. And it started yes. oh, what's it? before the quarantine. He's done a deep dive into every Bowie, uh, every Bowie one. And he's a, he's a deep music journalist, but he got another deep journalist to talk about this. And this is a three-part, two and a half hours. It's fun. Yeah. Um well, this album well, cover is intense it was called I album. like this one better yeah it was called album to album was the name of that uh podcast yes um let's see if i can find the guy's name but um i do like his work here now that i i've i've i can compare the two and see that i can see where where he is now he's got a really neat illustrative yet you know, the colors, he's all about the color. Hey, think about how um, he kind of shows up Mick here too, because yeah, this is beautiful, but Mick himself is rather small on the album cover, even though he's central, right? So David he's has to a... steal the artist and like make himself like freaking huge on his own cover. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's David nice that you're himself. one of 50 people on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like but what's interesting is the color scheme of this. You're right. There are really only like three three colors on both of the albums. If you look at Diamond Dogs, there you have blue, you have red, and you have yellowish gold. Yeah. And yeah, it is. It's... Hmm. And, yeah, it's um, pretty neat. It's pretty neat. But you know, that's what these guys are doing. They're, I mean, that, and that's great. That's what artists should do. You work with your modern dudes of your era, and you, hey, will you paint my cover? sure and then the artist is like will you play at my brunch you know or whatever and <laughs> well in the middle ages their artwork from the middle ages if you ever notice they're all just those three three they're just the three basic colors that i guess yeah they're they represent fire and mm. it's that gray charcoal that red and that orange and most and if you look at the middle ages their pictures all have skeletons somewhere in them you know, I mean, because they, it was the plague. I mean, everything right. it was, everything was stark and ominous. And I feel like these colors are very um, similar. It's just a similar mm -hmm. theme of just, you know, a plague. Right. <laughs> it's, and it's cool. Yeah. And you see, you do see the, the um, like the cityscape in the background yeah. and then the elect electric Bowie letters, like a give and give or take, kind of looks like Flash Gordon or something. Yeah, I like but that. Then, though. I like when you see like, like an old T-shirt with that on or something. I think it looks cool. Like oh, that. that, I would rather see it on. T it's it seems out of place there. I'd rather see more buildings actually. And then, but it's you know, funny it to does. see this I wood plank. Know. What's the wood plank? That's interesting. Like he's at the dock trying to get out. You know, it's a stage. Like, oh, it's the stage. Maybe. Nice. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, they're at and they're at the concert that that then we open up the track one to. I mean, that's what's fun about this album is that the narrator goes back and forth. Like, I don't know who's Zoom and who. We're first, it's like David Boy's telling us he's the narrator. And then sometimes he's in it. He's the character. And then sometimes he's speaking from the omnipotent, you know, omniscient, you know, narrator of the whole thing. Like, say, through, like, Big Brother. He's just telling us what the relationship is like that you want to have Big Brother. Um and so it's just back and forth, right? That's what's so fun well, about this. It looks more like a um, a carnival. Oh, okay. Stage the boardwalk, the strangest curiosities, and he has uh, it's on the back of it. Mm. If you see, it looks like okay. An old there you go. So yeah, yeah, like that sort of thing. Okay, on a on a boardwalk. Yeah, totally. He's half man, half dog, and next to him is the lady with the lobster hands or the bearded lady. Yeah, so how much of, uh, I wanted to ask you guys, who are probably deeper into 84 than I am, how much, you know, is the um, kind of Hitler-esque style abuse of the different in 80, 1984? 
are specifically such, you know, you know, people who are different. That that's the whole theme of the book. I well, know. It's, it's, it's not even that you're not allowed specifics. to be different. It's that's not even you're not even allowed to fall in love with anybody, right? Like it's Jesus, like, Jesus yeah. Christ. Wow. Zero free will. Yeah. Amazing. But when he talks about like um, being, you know, the the allusions to being transgender or to being youthful or to that's what he's, you know, is, is any of that in the book? Or of being I don't gay? I think it's just, overt. Uh, no, it's not no. overt. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to say no, but um, maybe he's just drawing a parallel to that, to like how those people would feel in, you know, uh, 70s England or, yeah. or um, and I guess compared to how people felt in the novel, you know, yeah. the lack of freedom. And he's just bringing in those plot lines from his own life and glam and rock and roll. And because, again, it's just the layers of this album are fun. I mean, he really, he broke so many barriers and he was such, um, he was such a visionary as far as, you know, pushing the envelope and just constantly. And that's why when you said he, we were talking before the show about firing the spiders from Mars and it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't this um, bad breakup. It was just, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm moving on from this. I want to just see what else I can do. And, you know, he did. He did Aladdin Sane came after, or was Aladdin Sane in 74 and, and Diamond Dogs was in 73? Which one? I know Life on Mars was. Yeah, Aladdin Sane was before. So that was still with the Diamond Dog, with, I'm that sorry, with the Spiders from Mars. Spiders from Mars, yeah. Hmm. But, um, and so you, you, this album, it is, it's significantly different than what he had previously done, which was still like, I'm sorry, Life on Mars. It is. It's so magical. So magical. But um, this was just, oh, it's, you know, you see artists and they kind of get stuck in one genre or one like, rhythm and all the music sounds the same. And don't hate me for saying this, but Gotti by Voices has not changed there. It's, <laughs> and I, like, I just, there's, <laughs> I saw them live like five years ago and I was so sad. The crowd was, <laughs> The crowd was so angry and wow, and I just I, the energy was just and it sounded yeah. it was just and I wanted something a little. Where where was that? <laughs> no, it was you, at the the garage yeah. sale. Wow. Sometimes that thing works, and and I did yeah. I I thought about like like what if Bowie stopped like if Bowie stopped after the Ziggy period and then faded away, you know, like many a good rocker could have, you know, <laughs> like yeah. so many good me. rockers. You yeah. Know? You and know, still about... hits, so many yeah. hits if he stopped at 74, you know, but he was like, no way. And I'm mm. not going to say that the in that the little engine called, you know, <laughs> the, engi the, the, the little engine that cocained, um, you know, made it, but that helped certainly find that next corner, that next mountain to climb, the next mountain mm. of cocaine to climb. But you're right. He's searching for the next thing and God love him that he, that, that that's what it makes him different. You know? Yeah. He, I mean, and then even then he, he said, I don't know if I'm going to stay a musician. I think I might be an actor or I might, you know, write a book. He loves write. You know, he talked about loving writing. I don't know a ton about his biography. I don't, Kind of like Shakespeare. I don't really know a lot about him. I don't want to know about him. I don't want to know about his wife, like because he's like he's mine. <laughs> like you know, kind of like, I just I know him through his music, and I love him through his music. You know, he's the only person who I literally openly cried. I I was driving to work, and I heard on the radio, um, you know, it was it was probably Let's Dance or something his 80s an 80s song which was totally different from diamond dogs you know and i heard it and then i switched stations and it wasn't you know it wasn't a college radio station it was like wmms and i heard sorrow by boat and i and i knew i'm like there's no way they're gonna be playing them on the radio unless he died there's wow. no way they're gonna play that song and i did i think my tears like hit the windshield the propelled oh sadness and I called my brother I said Dale you know and then of course it, you know and that they announced it and even then I don't know Black Star god that's a whole mm, that's right. a whole other just dive into Bowie you know the album right before he died mm -hmm. but, um 
I don't even know where where were we what were we talking about? Well, I was yeah, going to talk about to that. That's so uh, good. The importance of what he was saying, Fox, that he could have could have quit sometime in the mid seventies. Yeah. Thing. How important like, it was like, for us that he went on, right? Because I mean, that was, I mean, that was all of our entry point. I think the early eighties, those MTV, you know, Let's Dance and the yeah. Modern Love video. But it was, I thought it was so cool. Like even as a kid, like okay, you got, you have these two like pop songs, Let's Dance and Modern Love. But then MTV would also also play As Ashes to Ashes, and you're like, why? Well, even when you're like eleven years old, like what's that? <laughs> like he, yeah, like he was crazy three years ago, right? And but then on the um, classic rock stations, you're hearing Rebel Rebel and Changes and Space Out. Mm -hmm. You're like, like even as a little kid, you, you have this appreciation that this guy was a force you know and um, absolutely and he absolutely. could he could do it on all different levels you know yeah mm. yeah and he needed and, and he deserved everything all the recognition that happened when he passed away i thought he was treated properly and and um you know and maybe not even maybe he's even better than we even thought you know but uh yeah absolutely well, i think he's still he's still in the universe <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely absolutely. he's still I, around I was a big fan of the first Tin Machine album. Whenever that, I was still in high school when that came out because it was uh, David Bowie and they were dressed in suits, but they were like totally rocking. Like it sounded like metal. I was like, oh man. So yeah, I remember being really into that yeah. album. Um, exactly. It was just yeah. like respect. Yeah, I had that cassette. I had hmm. one of their cassettes. Cassette. Yep. Drum. It said drummer, drum on it. But uh, yeah, he, he just wouldn't stop. And you knew that he was that kind of guy that just kept on going. You know, like a guy that really, really, because because yeah. to know his whole career is really insane, and to know that he was dying to be like a pop star, like he tried to be a proper pop star to go on the British shows, like he's he was nearly a child actor trying to get into the scene, not a child actor, but he was going to these little young poppy shows, just trying to get on and singing and and doing things. And I mean, he always wanted to perform. He loved, I think that was his first love. He did truly want like popularity and fame to the extent to have control and love and freedom. I think that's the way I'd heard him talk about it. Like sometimes you got to sell yourself to, to get what you want in the end. This is a long time coming. Such a long career he had. Fucking. Um. Oh. So I'm sure you guys have seen this picture before, right? It's kind of an iconic uh, photo of Bowie around that time, right? 70, so this is in conjunction with the release of Diamond Dogs. Uh, Terry O'Neill was the photographer. But um, I think it's interesting, the book on the floor, because as we've talked about, um, you know, he's reading Burroughs and uh, you know, Brian... talking about his boots? Brian Geisen was also another big uh, cut-up you know, when you're talking about the cut up technique, Fox, oh, yeah, yeah, Brian, yeah, yeah. Brian Geisen was another guy really involved in that. And he's, um, you know, he's writing about Orwell. So he's really into reading. <laughs> he's really into literature. But it's, I think it's funny the book he has on the floor here um, is this book, The Immortal by Walter Ross, which is just, um, you know, I looked this up and it just seems to be some kind of cheesy, kind of pulpy, book about a fictitious uh, movie you know, like a james dean-esque movie star who dies huh. and um like it, it just and it's not like well regarded or well remembered at all it's just some like stupid poppy book isn't that, isn't that kind of funny though that he would have that right here so then you wonder if it is some pulp fiction fun thing to read if he just did, if he actually was reading it because yeah, like, or if he, like, like Jip said title. Yeah, yeah. He liked the he title. Con he constantly consumed art and literature and music. Or he's like, you know what would be funny? Is I'm <laughs> sitting here reading and there's a dog <laughs> brandishing his unads. <laughs> I don't know. It's almost like I wonder if he was throwing people a curveball, right? He certainly liked doing that, right? So if he's talking about burrows and orwell and in interviews and then just like have some kind of pulpy sure trashy like, what do you want to look at do you want to look at my boots or do you want to look at the book <laughs> what do you what means more that yeah. i'm well read or well styled but he would have put thought into it you know it's not just i mean any 
if, if you're ever photographed with a book, you would put thought into Absolutely. what book it was, right? Absolutely. But um, <clears throat> but one interesting thing about this book, though, this cover, uh, Warhol designed this. So this is Warhol's, um, oh, when he was still doing commercial art before he had the whole pop art. Explosive. So this is 19, 1958. Uh, this is uh, ah, a war, Warhol design. Well, that's it. Yeah. That's it. These are the days. He's hanging out with Lou in these days. He's hanging out with Iggy. He's going to America. He wants to be so American. This is, I mean, and you know, I, I, I know. <laughs> and this is when I bitch about Britain all the time, and I don't need to. I need to respect, respect to the king prince whoever just passed oh yeah i'm sorry yeah yeah his cute pictures of him and the dog that's cute but to hear the british talk about like fear of america and like loving america so much i love that bring it on because we know you love it so much i mean mm -hmm. yeah because we because most of their great ideas came from us <laughs> sorry you know <laughs> Um, I can't remember if it was uh, Iggy Pop or was it um, Bowie wanted that Detroit sound, so he started mm -hmm. out Iggy Pop, and Iggy Pop actually just like a, just adored him, and uh, he helped. Yeah. he helped. He helped Iggy's career. Oh my God! I saw him on. You can you can go on the Google and get lost in those old seventies eighties TV talk shows. I, uh, David and Iggy. Bowie and Iggy on like I don't know, it was Dinah Shore or someone like uh, or, or no, I was the other cool guy, uh, I forget his name, but oh, it was an amazing talk show. They're just there. Iggy performs, but David's just there to support. He's just there as a sidekick talking. He's just there. It's amazing. Um, it's late seventies. But I I wonder if um, I mean if it wasn't for Bowie. I mean, I don't see it as impossible that Iggy Pop and um, Lou Reed could have been slowly forgotten. I mean, because I mean, so he loved them, right? And but remember, Iggy kind of saw himself as washed up, you know, in in the early seventies, post Stooges, right? And um, yeah, Lou Reed. I mean, you know, I mean, the Velvet Underground wasn't even successful in their time, right? So they're yeah. they're kind of obscure being a rock stars going into the 70s right and um but then like when bowie got big and he really championed them and and you know he produced uh, lou reed's transformer album which is one of the best albums yeah. ever and um yeah just you know i mean didn't he also produce uh miggy pops uh what the idiot Absolutely. or something lust for life stuff yeah. like like he I totally propped, propped those guys up and got them yeah. through got them through like uh uh shaky time and yeah, yeah. um you know now now they're I wouldn't, I wouldn't um qualify warhol as that person who i think a lot of people felt that warhol was responsible hmm. for yeah, there you go album. i agree well I warhol like warhol did music. a lot with with the velvet underground's music but i guess i'm talking about like post post velvet underground and what would have become of lou reed afterwards yeah, i think i think bowie was a big help to keep them through the 70s because, I mean, they, yeah, because Bowie is a synthesis of a lot of what those two bands specifically were doing. And then Bowie just made it way bigger and greater and more marketable. And you want, you know, what makes Bowie different than any of these guys? You know, everybody's doing so many great things in these, but Bowie's just so singular. And I don't know, you, you know, he speaks for you and you want to be him at the same time. He uh, he's just so special. Like when I compare him to Mick or Roger Waters or any of these other guys, I mean, I don't know, Mick's different, but compared to Roger Waters, I don't want to be Roger Waters. I want to be David Bowie. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Bowie could sell everything. So the fact that he was able to take all the grittiness of the Velvet Underground and Iggy Pop and make it beautiful and sexy and then meet disco and soul in this new age uh, yeah, he better have done that, you know, same way the Stones took, you know, Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker occasionally and took the old bluesmen up that they were, you know, taking from and coming up from, you know, that uh, maybe that's what Bowie's doing in a way, you know, and those guys were down and out probably drugs and money. 
he used his powers for good, right? Like he, <laughs> yeah. he, he got those guys back on track, right? Well, to yeah. some degree, they also partied together pretty hard, I'm sure. But, um, and I think also Krautrock, him, him champion, championing, championing, championing. You have trouble with that one. I always have trouble saying that word, championing. Him Jeez. championing uh, Krautrock. Which he starts it's to do on this. The lack of trophies in Cleveland. Yeah. The lack of trophies totally. in Cleveland. You just it's can't a foreign, it's word. a foreign word to us. <laughs> no, uh, we have one. Yeah, we do. Championing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> made me lose my training. Yeah, but okay, he starts He starts um, referencing Krautrock on this album. And um, True. yeah, the reason why Krautrock is so remembered and so loved might also be because of David. Like, I think he was a huge force... I think he was a huge cultural force even outside of his music. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. And I think also we can sit here and applaud David Bowie for a thousand years and say how he might he is he is I think he's better than the Rolling Stones to me because that he he has something to offer. The Stones kind of are a jukebox of the world in many ways, but you know, <laughs> how many times can you drink yes. jukebox and, of the world? So they, they're a great jukebox of the world, but Doe, Bowie is giving us something new, you know. Like I can't get, you know, you got to go somewhere else, not the jukebox, to get Even Bowie. Posthumously, he gave us yeah. new, which is just fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah I mean, he just has the staying power. Like, I mean, I'm gonna go crazy here as I'm listening to this album. I'm thinking like. This album pulls together three different worlds and Bowie's just in the middle of it. You know, I, we know that he's in the glam thing. He's finished Ziggy and he's moving on and we all hear it here, but I, you hear the rock and roll in this album. For me, this is like this three-headed album monster. You've got the musical story of 1984, which to me is really the element of musicals. He's using new elements of music he doesn't do it. Rock and roll. I mean, Ziggy Stardust is a rock and roll album, but here he can stretch out parts and bridges. He's got expert musicians. So I hear musical, I hear soul, funky ass soul, and then good old rock and roll. I hear those three, like, and meaning black music. I hear a lot of like funk and Donna Summer, Curtis Mayfield in this album, and then the good old Stone style rock and roll. So there's, there's those three parts I hear the musicals, the soul, and then the rock and roll. Crazy. Oh, I agree 100%. I'm so, oh. happy. I'm so happy that you guys <laughs> did the deep dive of oh. time. And <laughs> how do you guys look? And I don't want to, I mean, how big into musicals are you guys? I know Gypsy, you're kind of into musicals, aren't you? <laughs> what about you, honey boy? Uh, no, not especially. I mean, um, I don't think I've ever been to a musical. My sisters watched <laughs> Grease a lot growing up. I know every. Oh. Every line well, agrees. Okay. Not not by choice. Um, you know. Yeah, it, I mean, well, went, that's a contemporary too. That's contemporary of this here album, Greece. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah I'm yeah, gonna yeah. say I'm not an authority on musicals. Why why ask the question? I'm not oh, this I'm is not, a musical. This is a this is a yeah. musical. I hear all day. I don't know. Are you guys hip to more modern rock musicals? Because obviously, Tommy comes out before this. Guess what comes out before this? Hair. So I think that Tommy, Tommy and Hair are really influencing Bowie like a lot here. You know. So I think Bowie's like hearing this, like storytelling through song. But what now that I'm hearing Bowie, but then I've lived, and this is 2020. I've heard Rent and Hedwig and the Angry Inch, and those are two of the greatest modern rock musicals made you know rent is made in the late 90s and i saw it live it's amazing and then hedwig and the angry inch if you guys yeah. aren't hip to that late 90s oh, or early 2000s too, yeah it's all over this musical like you do you hear the rock elements of telling a story so many of the hooks you know are honey boy do you know about hedwig and the angry inch i know i know of it and i know you love it and i know wells loves it but i uh yeah, yeah i've never listened to it yeah. So the last track, for example, Midnight Radio is a smack steal from Rock and Roll All Night With Me. It, it's the same basic song. I mean, it just has the similar crescendos that you see the elements that are all there. And Stephen Trask, the great rocker 
who wrote the Hedwig music, who was in a band called Cheater. And he's gone on. He's just great. He's done a lot of great things. But he had to have known and loved this album to write then Hedwig. To, I mean, you just hear it. It's so there. It's all there. It's all yeah, there. I, have, I have Hedwig on CD. I had it. Yeah, listen um, to it I, now. I bought it when I saw that when I saw it live. It was pretty incredible. Just elements, though. Just elements. Everybody loves each other, and I love it. It's great to see Bowie in these things and Rent. So the the yeah. musical Rent. Rent is was also based, based on La Boheme. Yes. The opera La Boheme. Yeah. About a tuberculosis. It, it was, it, but Rent was the modern version of of the AIDS. Exactly. And, and so it has, that has that apocalyptic kind of like, oh, my God, yeah. let's jump in the river and die, take some drugs, see a band, jump in the river and die. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so as, as we mentioned, is kind of a rivalry with Mick. So do, do you think Bowie wanted to um, outshine uh, Pete Townsend with Tommy? He's like, all right, he's doing Tommy. I'm going to do 1984, right? Yeah, when, yeah, sure. What, when, well, I, when did Tommy yeah. come out? Tommy's 69. Oh, so, wow. Okay. You know, he's Two already done earlier. it. Yeah, Tommy's, Tommy's already hit the road. And uh, yeah, That's but I mean, answer. his answer was his answer was Ziggy, really. I mean, Tommy's Ziggy, you know, he's he's there. The thing about Bowie, I mean, he had his band, but he was never a band. And I think he yearned <laughs> for that. He thought the boys, the Mick Ronson guys and the Spiders, you yeah. know, but he realized that he couldn't. And he maybe he realized he never could like be a band. I don't. I mean, it's he's because he's he's himself. Maybe you know that's so interesting. Mick, Mick Ronson was working on solo stuff at this time, so I mean, yeah. you know, I think Mick, Mick Ronson had and even had before other ideas the too. Spiders, he's he's making hits with Space Oddity and and other hits even before he gets Mick Ronson and the guys. You know, um, yeah, hmm. the competition's there for sure, for sure. Can you imagine seeing Diamond Dogs perform live, though, as a musical? <laughs> and, yeah, from what I heard, this is when, yeah, he went off. Like, this was big show. Oh. A spectacle. Did you, um, <laughs> did you ever see Cats? <laughs> I didn't. I haven't. No. Oh, tell I was us, 11. Tell us. And I was terrified. <laughs> I was 11, and my Uncle Johnny took us. We were in New York City, and I remember I had an aisle seat, and the cats come up to you and they have these like <laughs> razor eyes. Uh, it was it was terrifying. That's and Bowie, I, man. That's, yeah, that's right? totally that's rats the mom. size of cats. Cats. Yeah. That's Please, Bowie. The but rats. could you imagine how horrific living in the aisles of that world? That's the apocalyptic 1984 world. It's kind of why this isn't a hit because it's horrible. It's a horrible doom he's singing about. The whole thing's in a minor chord, I'm sure. Yeah, but then he embraces it. <laughs> yeah, but <sighs> that's why Just radical accents is, is the no hardest other step. Yeah, There's yeah. no other choice. Yeah. <sighs> oh, yeah, we want to talk crowd okay. rock. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So talk us about the, the 1984, uh, the Paradise Lost. Okay. Well, all right. So Bowie was... Um, yeah, he was way into kraut rock, which we're, we're going to see later. You know, his low album was almost a tribute to kraut rock. But um, this is the first point I could really see it. I mean, um, you know, you can correct me if someone sees it earlier, but this is um, in, uh, yeah, Sweet Thing Reprise leading into Rebel Rebel. It goes into this kind of jammy thing here. All right, let's do this. How great they go into Rebel Rebel from there. Oh, anyway, I'm not gonna play it. I mean, that's just a great little uh, moment that's of the amazing. album that that leads into Rebel Rebel, right? Because um, it is, because is... it's Kraut Rock. I mean, 
th- this is, those are German troops marching. Jesus. Because <laughs> it's just, that's why, I mean, he just uses sound so well to paint these images yeah. mm. of darkness. And it's, that's like, coming to get you, coming to get you. Yeah, and yeah. then it's like, no, no, not today. Rebel, <laughs> rebel. <laughs> Enjoy your dress. Yeah, yeah, Woo! yeah. We're going out tonight, baby. We're going to dance. <laughs> You know, it's perfect. He plays with uh, you all the whole album, taking you. He's making you know. Oh. I just, I just love that transition that is, to go from there is, to Rebel Rebel. But that is where the 1984. It's this whole Big Brother. You can't, but oh no, we are. We are going to fall in love. You know, and mm-hmm. it is, and I. That is on the. What is that? Yeah. No. Yeah, that's on the B side. Yep. I should know this. Um, because I do think the the B side, I think that the second side of the album is definitely more geared towards 1984. But once that was scrapped, I do think that it follows mm-hmm. Milton's Paradise Lost to gotcha. a T. Hey, Gypsy, um, hold. Can you hold that thought for a second? Let me just let me just play this, and so I could collapse it. So this is um. Right. This is this is where I think that that um, what we just heard. I think he's kind of lifting from Noi, the Noi debut album, which came out two years earlier, and I know Bowie was a fan of. So see what you think. Don't, oh you think, don't you think he was borrowing from that? I mean, in, a, in an awesome Bowie way. <laughs> sure. Oh, that's aw- What year was that, honey? That was 72. So it was two years earlier. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, go ahead. Uh, no way. Go ahead with the Paradise Lost. <laughs> yeah. No, so, <laughs> get all excited. Um, no, I just, you know, like I said, this is, you know, Brian and I have listened to this album hundreds of times, but that, I think, I mean, that f- when that first opening howl, and we talked about this in the beginning, when he, I, it, it's as if he is just, he's just kicked out of the, kicked out of the garden and finds his way in hell. And he's like, what is this? You know, what, is, what, and it's just coming to terms with basically the choices that you've made in life and how you're going to now just deal with it and create that, create your heaven in your own how, but then become the king of it. Right. And I feel that that first part of the album, he goes through those stages of shock, fear, you know, all those stages that you have when you go through grief and then um, just, acceptance finally and then dominion <laughs> mm. um so he was an angel at the beginning and now he's like thrown into this dirty city running around on dog legs <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah. he has and he has to make some meaning of it so he um he has to team up with the rebel rebel girl right guys i'm sorry Ooh, I'm, I'm, I like I'm like that. sitting over here <laughs> <laughs> trying to run an IEP on a Saturday night. And I totally, I'm like, let's like over here to conversation. I totally just want to like bring everybody into the living room and just start spinning records. <laughs> ah, this, nice. this, got, this is like totally fun for me. And I'm like on the outskirts of like, oh, these are Annie's friends. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't chime in. Can't, I, but like, oh God, it would be so great to have you because just move out of Diamond Dogs and everything else. Yeah. You guys got a great thing going here, man. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Welcome. Yeah. 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 I've, seen, I've seen the honey boy. I've seen some of your, some, some of your, she, Annie showed me a couple of the other podcasts. Oh, good. Man, that's, <laughs> nice. That's like the life. Like hang out every it? once in a while, talk about albums. But. Yeah. Brian, what's your favorite track on this album? On this album? It's hard. It's, it's hard to say yet, but it's, yeah. all right. So, 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 so the grabber track for me is Candidate. 
Because uh-huh. yeah. I just, I just love, just that song. Just it, 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 it punches you in the face from the beginning, and it doesn't stop punching you till you swoop into the next song, which just flows in so seamlessly. Yeah. But then, stepping outside of that, there really isn't a favorite song. This, this, this album exists exactly as as it was originally like made to be played from beginning to end and be seen on stage. So every time I pop this in, I, I do, I kind of like put myself through like a metal frenzy where I'm like, I'm, I'm watching this at the same time I'm listening to it. Mm. And uh, there, isn't, there isn't really one aspect of this album that doesn't grab and, and, and grit. Mm-hmm. So nice. as far as a favorite track, I don't, I, I don't have one. But <laughs> as far as the one that, that brought me to it, I can, I can t- tell you it was Candidate. Does nice. that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah, and we've already we've already quoted that 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 uh, that track a couple times. I oh, figured man. since I'll tell you, I figured since Annie brought this album here with us, and I know that her big brother herself, her own big brother, has yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, musical influence over her. I'm like, don't even start. Dale is like, hey, Ann, listen to this, Big Brother. Yeah, yeah I'll that, that's me, no, and I can see me. Dale like singing over her. <laughs> Like someone <laughs> to claim you, you know. <laughs> well, it's funny because Dale. I mean, he loves. He actually, he does. He loves. He loves this album. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, but he didn't yeah. introduce this to me. This okay, was right. That was I didn't. A nice little find. This is a nice little find for us. But you do have a big brother, and he I has do. a he He's has wonderful. a beautiful role in your life. You know. No. You know, and luckily, you. not like that kind, but at times no. like that. At times, you, know, <laughs> you, you need someone to watch over you. Dale you know? was so smart when we were in college. He would always, he wouldn't, he'd be the cool big brother and he would let me, he right. would, he would never tell me that he had all of his friends watch, like knowing where I was. <laughs> I know. I was like, part, I worked for him. I was his <laughs> watch out for Gypsy crew. You were one of them. You're one yeah, of them. Yeah, I went to his trainings. He had trainings. <laughs> yeah. I did. I had like 15 big brothers as a freshman. So I'm better for it. That while we're talking favorite songs, sorry, that's my favorite song. Oh my god, which I, one? I, I, is Big Brother. Oh, Big Brother. That, that's oh, the yeah. one that's got the hook. I mean, besides obviously Rebel so Rebel, Rebel Rebel is like another world. I don't even feel it fits this album. It's so good. It's un, it's un, an unbelievable rock song. So anyway, it is. but I don't feel like, you know, anyway, when we talk about this album, it's the, it's yeah, that, that big brother just gets me. I love that. Big brother. Track. Yeah, it's, it it's is, so it's just, it is, it's fun. It's scary. But when I heard that line on candidate about taking drugs, jumping in the river, I was like, Oh my Holding God. Holding hands. Well, that's when. <sighs> I think of like the river sticks and I know it's very Ooh. take you to the other side, you know? Yeah. And I know it's, you know, a little Greek mythology, but I mean, it's, he, it's a story, you know, and there's all, you got to find those illusions and stories. Mm-hmm. And that, that to me, I think, I feel is that's where they're, that's what, that's the river they're jumping in. And so as as we're looking at the tracks here more, definitely the the side two that's got more of the conceptual eighty four theme going. Yeah, the song itself is I can't believe the song nineteen eighty four. Looking at it, track three here is only three minutes and twenty sec- seven seconds. It sounds like it's twenty five minutes long. Like this song is the longest three minutes and twenty seven seconds ever, because Bowie, the, the whole song is just magical, and and this is the one that's a real musical. Rent is just is all over this, this one. It's just and then it's he's got the disco elements. That's where I hear the Curtis Mayfield kind of like. Oh my like god, it's, Curtis it's Mayfield moving. We have Curtis Mayfield is I never ever knew or loved. Yeah, I know him until. I, so I, I, I like I hear like Superfly came out this year. Yeah. And so you hear some elements of Superfly in that 84 album, uh, I think, uh, you know, quite a bit. But uh, His I mean, story in, in, is so you know, sad, too. I mean, he, his voice, his voice was just, it, 
magical. <laughs> yeah. And so Bo song, love you. Bowie was pulling from everywhere, right? So on yeah. that um yeah. that uh that podcast box, you remember they were talking about even like stuff like Barry White. He was saying he was pulling from Barry early Barry White albums and early Bruce Springsteen, who, he, who you would think was totally opposite. He was pull, right. pulling from things you totally wouldn't expect that he was putting on this this album. I can hear Barry White. Absolutely. I don't know about, I don't, maybe, I don't know. See, Bruce Springsteen a little bit, that rock and roll with me kind of makes me think of Bruce Springsteen. Like, like <laughs> well, when I was trying to look at it through a Springsteen lens to understand what the point the guy was trying to make, I'm like, okay, I could, I could see it a little bit there. Yeah. But, um, like, what a great song. That's one of the songs where I hear him taking a different narration. He's having this relationship with his fans. Like, there's a leader in this apocalyptic world. I'll take you there kind of thing and he's just lived that through Ziggy so he knows that perspective that's this this is just fun, such a fun um perspective to take um yeah that song is so fun what a fun song do you guys I feel like we should play song since we did we did the little uh, almost like trailer intro and then just a little bit of sweet thing reprise why don't we play a uh, candidate sure what do you think Ryan's favorite song, right? I know. <laughs> he's not in the room anymore. I he's I love him. He's so it, we do. We sit and we listen to records and All right. Just a second. My Any other kind of day You'll pretend we're walking home Cause your future's at stake My set is amazing It even smells like a street There's a bar at the end Where I can meet you and your friend Someone scrawled on the wall I smell the blood of the tree cutters Wrote up scandals In other bars We're having so much fun With the wife and his people Spreading rumors and lies And stories they made up some make you sing and some make you scream One makes you wish that you've never been seen But there's a shop on the corner that's selling happy and shady Making bulletproof faces Call and ask me at the clinic if you want it Boys, better hear this So you scream out of line, I want you, I need you Number one, and say, Dirty, I want you. When it's good, it's really good. And when it's bad, I go to be safe. Oh wow! Wow, that's, what's, that, that's why none of these tracks need to be separated. You know, it's it's hard. Wow, candidate. <laughs> oh, what a build! I mean, that this whole album is like that one song. It, that's why that's such a great song. Just build so slow, and it takes you somewhere, and it drops you. It's amazing. Uh, so, 
does he say like the set is amazing it's even smells like a street is that, is that what he says because i yeah I, I feel like he's in, he's introducing the stage set right like he's introducing the yeah my set is amazing it smells like a street you know you know like the you know the world is a stage i don't know and he's he's trying to he's um campaigning hmm one is oh it's big big brother later in the album where he says um we're looking for an apollo and all that what is that um yeah exactly how does that go um it reminded me of trump actually <laughs> that uh the um oh someone someone to fool you someone blah blah blah, blah. some new apollo some new blah 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 yeah someone to yeah. claim us someone to follow exactly yeah yeah yeah. yeah yeah Somebody, oh, some, oh, it's, mm -hmm. it's someone like you yeah, that that's what's so amazing, and I mean, obviously, this is all coming from this totalitarian kind of perspective. But there's also a a hunger that is inside sometimes people that need to follow something, you know. And and when you yeah have such bad luck, like sometimes the way I frame it in U.S. history is we're just as down and out as Germany is in the 1930s, but we just don't fall for Hitler. We fall for FDR. And sometimes people criticize FDR, like he wasn't the greatest either, you know, but at least we got lucky falling for this guy, you know, like we could have fallen for something worse. And, uh, and Bowie knows that he knows that people kind of like uniforms and order and those things like I, I you know, when in all of his stuff is all just. You know, and and it's comparable to like the wall. You see what Roger Waters does with yeah. this world. All these British cats getting over World War II. We didn't. We don't know this, young Americans living here, man. Like what it was like to come out of that war. And so they're seeing. You know, it's a lot more serious for them. So I think it it ends up in their art all the time. Yeah, and and you the lyrics that you were just quoting. Someone. Um, Someone to claim us, someone to follow. Yeah. Someone to shame us, some brave Apollo. So you have those, those almost the pair, it's a paradoxical, like those lines are, they're right. opposites, but they're both true because it's like, oh, I'm following the propaganda. This is an Apollo. This is someone who will, who will, I can follow them. They're going to help me. They're going to save me, but oh, they're really shaming you and they're really claiming yeah. you. And really, so those undertones are what we ignore when as a society we're afraid we are, you know, we've made mistakes or for whatever reason mm -hmm. we're in this very vulnerable position. Yeah. We look for a savior, a savior, a savior, you know, yeah. and, um, it can get really ugly if you yeah, yeah. and it's gotten ugly here in this country absolutely and this is, this and is I, exactly and I, what's happening the parallels are it is are, are, are obvious it's real. and that these that these themes come around in the world constantly yes and, and i mean yeah it's absolutely it's it's just starting to follow something and believing in something and you know yeah. and a lot of people in america really feel no i know like they Can I feel I feel yeah. that there are, you know, and I know you probably get it with people asking you, how can you be a teacher and how do you, you know, how could you teach teenagers and, oh, the world is falling apart. Oh, suck. And I honestly would rather be around them. <laughs> they keep me young and uh, they give me hope. And, you know, and I know I'm going on a tangent, but I, I do feel that these, you know, yeah, and I think that's what Bowie's trying to give us hope. Bowie's trying to give us hope because, I mean, at he least is. his voice and his presence and is, just, is comforting. And as a human, I know, like, when, as a human, but when he, he was such a good person, too. Mm. And he really loved, I think, more overall. And yeah. he didn't have boundaries with his love. And I think that's what was so magical I know I keep saying he's magical, but he is. He is this, you know, alien being. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. You know, to kind of lighten the mood, I suppose. <laughs> what I was well, you, you had a big brother, honey boy. You you really had a you had a good big brother experience, kind of like Gypsy did too, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, he's one my he's one year older than me, so it's not um 
That's we kind of always amazing. felt like the same age in a way, but um, oh, okay, yeah, absolutely. No, no, that's, great, that's great, big brother. Is that's Luke's good. younger than you? Yeah, Luke's younger than me, but Mark, Mark still lives it's in Mark. You're right. Mark lives in Cleveland. He, you know, I mean, he lives in uh, Willoughby Hills, right? Nice. Um, no, but I was gonna say just something funny when he. Um, Okay, when he's talking about some brave Apollo, I, 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 I remember, this thing. I remember um, just being in a very giggly mood with a dustbin one time back in the day, oh. uh, listening to music. And um, oh, it was that, was it, was it that song, We Need a Hero or something like that? Is it, who's that, Bonnie Tyler or somebody? Who is that? Oh, oh it's on for, Tina Turner. Hold, no, no, I Holding On for a Hero, know. maybe? We don't need another hero. No, it's All not. We don't need another hero. It's we... under the hero to the morning light. That's yes. Footloose. Yeah. Oh, that's is it great. Footloose? And that's a uh, Bonnie. I want to say it's Bonnie it Tyler. Bo it's Bonnie Tyler. Yeah. Bonnie Tyler. Yeah. And listening to that with Dustin one day, and we were just dying laughing at that one line about uh, the streetwise Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> I need a streetwise Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the brazen use of oh mythology and pop yeah. culture. That's awesome. Like I would oh like a God. yeah. Like when he says some brave Apollo. I mean, you know, it's approaching that streetwise Hercules territory. Hercules. Yeah, absolutely. Streetwise Hercules. I mean streetwise Hercules. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I'm a street mm. walking student with a high pull, pull of napalm. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> But what he did, what he's doing, I mean, what he's with that simple turn of a phrase, all he wants to do is rhyme someone to follow, <laughs> you know, but what he does is brilliantly bring in a, an entire civilization that bought the idea of Greek mythology. <laughs> like if you want to see a illusion. bunch of cuckolds, look at these guys, you know, oh my, I mean, it's crazy. Hmm. Um. I like that he calls the, um, you know, that one track, uh, We Are the Dead, right? Because I, I always loved um, this scene in the book, right? When uh, Winston and Julia yeah. sneak, sneak off together, right? And um, I think they've just kind of had a romantic moment, if I remember correctly, and it's kind of afterwards, and uh, they're just talking about their situation, right? And Winston uh -huh. says, We Are the Dead, right? And I, I, I remember it as Winston kind of looking out the window and Julia maybe being behind him in bed, I think. But, and we are the dead. And then Julia echoes, we are the dead. And then that voice comes in, right? You right. are the dead. Yeah. Said an iron voice behind them. And it's so terrifying because that, at that moment, you just know that everything, they're not getting away with anything. They're, from, from, from that point in the book, they're caught and um, they're oh, tortured and okay. it's just, there's no turning back, right? So, um, I mean, I, I just think it's cool that he, uh, you know, he chose that line because I, I just, uh, that's a very crucial, memorable part of the book, I think. Right, and what I learned from the, I went from the podcast was that he was gonna call the whole album that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are the dead. We are the dead. Yeah. And then is and then the publicist is like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know, David. I don't know if that'll if that'll sell so well, David. You know, <laughs> can we think about that? You know, hey, this, well, this album I, must I, go ahead. Go ahead. I said it's just a very um, stark ending, and just. Um, it, it's the result of what happens when you you are kind of this observer, witness, bystander, mm -hmm. and you just don't step in if you feel something's off, and it just snowballs into something that it, it's, by the time you do want to say something, it's out of control, and 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 that's how it ends. It's this real ominous ending. It, it's just it's it's it is. It's sad and depressing and <laughs> apocalyptic. Yeah. So don't be advised. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and so and and the album kind of ends. I mean, even this whole album ends kind of yeah. way. 
it, 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 it would make sense to though put it back on again yeah. and listen to it from the beginning <laughs> yeah 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 but yeah i mean of course he shouldn't turn it into a happy story right i mean <laughs> you know <laughs> that would suck yeah <laughs> So it, it does make sense that it would kind of end on a down note, of course. Mm -hmm. My students always say, why do we le read such depressing stories? Everything's so sad. Everybody dies. Everybody's poisoned. <laughs> da, da, da. I said, but those are the, that's, that's the interesting. That's interesting. You know, if you that's see somebody, two identical people, but one has like a scar, like right across his face, which one do you want to, which one, whose story do you want to know? Right? Yeah. The survivor, he story. survived something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But you're right. It, it doesn't end happily at all, but it leaves you feeling happy because you just went on this beautiful ride, this magical ride with Bowie. <laughs> and and that, let's not take freedom for granted. Yes. Uh, uh, and let's vote and let, you know, um, wow. Yeah, and so evidently he's he's seeing the stones a lot. He's living in London during one during this time, and so he sees them a lot. It's unbelievable how many of these songs are rocking like the stones, but it's as if he wants to get away from that sound, which is why there's so much more groovy sounds on that later album. The way he builds things so brilliantly, like Candidate we heard, and 84 is just like almost it's it's practically disco it's funky it's grooving forward it's it's uh there's and then of course after this he records his next couple albums in the states i believe isn't it the next album he records in the states so he's really longing for some of that sound um yeah yeah he's digging the american sound a lot i think on this album starting to get into it Okay, yeah, I wanted to mention, because um, we, we kind of only briefly talked about the personnel on this album, but um, I wanted to mention that Herbie Flowers, who plays bass on this album, uh, played bass on Lou Reed's Transformer album in 72. And uh, so that's his uh, iconic bass line in uh, Walk on the Wild Side. You which can is, wow. hear it. Mm. You can totally hear it. Um. I didn't know oh, that. That's really shout cool. out to Herbie Flowers. Yeah, that's Herbie great. Herbie Flowers. What a name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And a lot of these yeah. guys are su these are superstar sessions guys that just get around. Like Tony Visconti is this the magic behind all this, right? Besides that wonderful name, Visconti. Um, uh, is uh, and he's the he's the magic behind. He's American, right? He's American, but he's got the he's isn't he American, right? Am I right? But he comes over to Britain and becomes like a producer kind of magic guy for T-Rex and others, right? I, th I think so. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm not... pretty sure that's right. I did okay. a little bit of research. I'm pretty sure. I just, I just need. I mean, he's a big name, and because big name, he is. I'm name. surprised he's not the producer of this album. But on some Bowie albums, he's the producer, right? Visconti. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. So he's been around. He's just a great guy. He knows his music stuff. And like here, he's given the strings credits because he just does. But this is Bowie's album. Like, I don't know. I think Pete Bowie's just in his head so much that he's like, no, you can't, you know, <laughs> like, no, and you can't give anybody else the producer credit but, but Bowie. But I think later, you're right. He does get producer credit. So he's bringing in, he's probably putting his band together, which are Sessions guys from other bands and, um, and, and things um yeah but bowie plays so much of this al album that's why he comes from the spiders where he's probably coming up with the coming up with the songs on guitar or piano and then teaching them to the band and the band plays the songs so he's limited as to what he can come up with because he's got to deal with these fucking spiders from mars they, they can't play mm -hmm. everything that bowie wants to play and now Bowie's imagination can go nuts with Tony Visconti's buddies and they can play anything and they're just, and their, their musicianship is fantastic and little, you know, I mean, so is, so does Bowie's become fantastic. I think his musicianship is just starting to take off. He's playing everything. I didn't know he played was the sax. Was this the first time Visconti was producing his album? An album for him? 
I'm not Good sure. Good question. I don't. I think he. I think they're working together in a little ways. It might be their first full album. Visconti's on the scene. That's for sure. Mm. But I don't know if he's um, if he's produced a Bowie album. This could be his first. Because he was scouting new, new, you know. Yeah. New talent. I don't know. Yeah. One. All right, Fox. All right, so yeah, Tony Visconti, because you know who knows how to make a biscotti or any of those complicated things. Tony Visconti is like David Bowie's boy. Like they've gone, they were back together way back in the day. I didn't. We we I had to clear that up. I knew that they were. This was this is his first like. Well, he produces. What did we say? Man who sold the world. Uh, he's got producer and playing uh, record. You know, credits on that. But he also played with them and produced his earlier records too. He, he was, so I think he's one of his early guys. In fact, that did any of you two see that new Bowie movie that came out this year or last? Oh, the biopic? No. It's a little biopic where it catches Bowie in the late 60s. Oh, with Mark Maron? Is Mark yeah, Maron in there? Maron, yeah. Okay. I want to say even Maron plays Visconti, a, a type oh. of character who loves Bowie. He plays Visconti to, in it? I don't know. No, it's like, but it's like someone who loves him and is trying to get him big in America. Yeah. Well, that might be Visconti, the producer. Yeah, it might yeah. be person. It might be Visconti. I can but, see um, Mark But it's yeah. interesting to see Visconti playing a lot of instruments in other times too, and just sticking with them. <laughs> Every artist needs these muses. People, we've talked about other artists who have had muses. That's it's just so awesome. Man, but I mean, we're about to go out then. Um, oh, and also the, the 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 band here is that he's got Ainsley Dunbar plays drums in uh, in Journey. I guess he's their second drummer after Steve Smith. Steve <laughs> Smith's the founding drummer of Journey, right? Could be. Boy, th thank you. Could, we, could we, be. Could be. Yes, he <laughs> is. Steve Smith is the drummer for founding member of Journey, right, along right. with Neil Sean. In 1984, and the rest is of the gang. The yeah. Diamond Dog. You brought uh, this up about the yeah, absolutely. Oh, go ahead. What'd you say, Chips? No, you, speaking of muses, that yeah. uh, 1984 I think was the muse for Diamond Dog. Mm. Oh yeah. But it kind of morphed into something different. Hmm. Yeah. And then uh, it all kind of wrapped around itself and made sense in the end, anyways, right? Um, and it starts. Oh, well, one um, personnel connection or correction I should make from last week when Fox, remember when you were, uh, we were trying off the top of our heads to think of band members named Glenn. Do you remember that at one point last week? And there's so many more. I thought of Glenn Danzig, of course. Oh, of course. How can we forget Glenn Danzig? But I said, uh, I said that, that Glenn fun. Hughes, I said that Glenn Hughes was a member of Judas Priest. I was wrong. I was thinking of Glenn Tipton as a guitar player in Judas Priest. Glenn Hughes was in Deep Purple and very briefly Black Sabbath. Oh, more kick-ass yeah. Glens, though. Yeah. More kick-ass Glens. Hmm. More kick-ass Glen. <laughs> <laughs> and what these about that? I know, I know. These yeah. are the Glens I know. Who's that tough guy, Glenn, from The Right Stuff that, that's in all those movies? He's a great Glenn, too. John but, Glenn. Um, uh, maybe a different one. Back to Bowie. Uh, you know that, so he goes on this tour. He only plays 14 dates. I mean, he kills America. He goes on, he tours this album in America. This tour, because like I said, I saw Bowie in 90. So when I did some tour research, this looks amazing. This show in Madison Square Garden that I'm looking at, 25 songs. Of course, halfway through, he does rock and roll with me. And then he finishes the whole show with rock and roll. Suicide. Oh, mm. oh my. God, what a fucking show. He starts the show with 1984. So you can oh. imagine it's 1974, Bowie's hip, and, and it's it's again it's just this disco funk freak out. He comes at you with 1984. Oh, so fun. What a what a show this must have been. And then to hear him sing all these songs, and he does do we're gonna go out with Big Brother. He sings this at the show also. Um, near the end of the near, near the end of the of the of the of the gig, and it, what an amazing show that would be! Yeah, it sounds incredible. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So really, I think I'm again, and Chips, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have found this if it wasn't for you. Thank you so much. You've introduced a lot of music to me over the years, 
And I mean, to specifically say this album is special, thank you so much for bringing us. Thank you. To our attention. I, um, I, this has been really fun. I love you guys. <laughs> oh, love you too. Love Great you. choice. Love you too. <laughs> think of it, think of other albums you want to discuss, right? All right. Yeah. And Brian can officially join us next time. We, we could be I a four, four headed so. monsters have been done on this show. We can do it again. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. Um, had fun listening on the outskirts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah, yeah nice to meet you. Too. You too, buddy. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. That was episode 24. And, and we're going to end with Big Brother. We're going to go out with Big Brother. Okay, just a moment. All right. All right, so we're gonna go out with Big Brother here, and uh, and and it's just it's just so fantastic. We hope you all have a good evening, and hope and hope you enjoyed this. Thank you, David. Thank yeah, you, thank Jibs. you, money boy. Thanks, Max. Thank you, guys. All right, Big Brother is watching you through your smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. All right, all right.